Welcome back to Cinema Flicks Music Picks. I'm Davey, your host with the most, the beast with the least. Oh, the least I can do today is apologise for that incredibly clickbaity thumbnail. Um, the dog would not leave until I took a picture of her. Um, so, there she was. Um, <laughs> and frankly, this is quite a depressing watch. So, yeah, maybe a bit, little bit of a, a glimpse of a, a nice little happy West Day's... Uh, is a nice setup. 1965 saw so the release of uh, Tomo Ishida's Fugitive from the Past. Never released outside Japan on home video. Heavily, heavily bootlegged because it has become one of the titles which were synonymous with world class filmmaking coming out of Japan. But because of, as we know from dealings with Toho and Dai and, and the legs the Japanese studios are not always the easiest to deal with and license from so it never saw a release outside of Japan on a home video until Arrow Video came along with this edition um, this yeah took a while to come to fruition um, and it put a lot of minds at ease because to talk inside baseball a bit Arrow Video were taken over by Zavi's uh, parent group the Hut group um, and instantly there seemed to be a tonal shift in their release strategies so we saw a lot more 4k upgrades um, of films that had been previously released we saw a decline in releases from Arrow Academy and then the total cancellation of Arrow Academy and um, with a great worry that that meant that certain films wouldn't be on Arrow anymore would it all be, oh, it has to appeal to the, the cult crowd or, um, you know, the 80s crowds, um, like um, pop culture, Stranger Things type stuff? Was it going to go that way? Was it going to be clickbait Arrow? And Arrow um, also lost Fran Simeone, who's now set up Radiance, his own film label. And it all looked a bit worrying. It all looked a bit worrying. And then Arrow said, we're releasing a fugitive from the past. And collectively, you could hear cinephiles the world over go, ah. Um, because this has been so long desired, it's not real. So we can now put away our um, very, <laughs> very low res bootlegs in my case, um, which I think I think is, is on a DVD-R with about two other movies. And this is a three hour movie, so that shows you how compressed it is. Um, this is the fully, unrestor fully restored rather, um, three hour, three minute cut of the film. Um, so as I said, directed by um, Tomo Ishida who did Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji and the Mad Fox. Um, worked for decades and decades, um, 50 odd years as a, as a director. Um, but this is considered to be his masterpiece. Um, so. Terrifically exciting that it's getting a worldwide exposure. It is released in the UK and North America as well on uh, Arrow Video over there. Um, it's a difficult one for me to go into in terms of plot um, because so much of it is ostensibly character driven um, and thematically driven that the plot can sound a little bit. Hmm, does that make merit three hours? Well, first of all, Japanese cinema tends to be very patient, um, especially of this era. And with a guy that grew up with contemporaries like Mizuguchi, Nozu, and Kurosawa. This film has in common, certainly with Ozu, patience. You will have scenes where scenes will, um, events will happen and then they'll just be allowed to settle for 10 seconds more than, than your instincts would tell you you should make a cut but that's fascinating because it's on top of a crime thriller so the story concerns three uh, ne'er-do-wells um, to, to varying extents who are um, in 1947 in the middle of a freak typhoon um, which really happens killed hundreds of people um, there is a burning pawn shop and the men take the opportunity to rob it and a murder occurs. One of the characters who becomes our protagonist 
is uh, I'm 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 kind of back backtracking on myself because um, I really don't want to spoil too much about his character and how it proceeds. Um, but he is uh, Inukai, played by uh, Red, Rentaro Mancuni. Um and Inukai is ostensibly <laughs> to go to a, another Sinifele kind of reference, the third man. He wasn't involved in the planning of this. The other two were. Um, he, and this isn't a spoiler because it happens in the first few minutes of the film, has to has to be there and a murder it's a choice between committing murder or going to jail for the rest of his life and living with the the guilt of what he has to do to you know get away so it's definition of a rock and a hard place um for for any guy he thinks he's chosen well he escapes with money and freedom and he takes the money and meets a young prostitute um, who is played by uh, Sushiko Hidari um, and what she does is shows him a glimpse at the bottom of society where he is too it's a film very much about class as well where he is too um, and he empathises, especially just after what he's had to do, he empathises so much with her that he gives her and not for sexual gratification, he just gives her money and says look, just look after yourself, okay just and then we have a big time jump, a massive time jump and Inikai has set himself up, um, he's become successful in business um, but his profile has been raised so much that the same young woman who thought he was just a kindly man who has risen um, through hard work and graft, which he has, um, deserves to be called out and promoted for it. However, Inikai obviously knows what he's done in his past and there's a police investigation. There, there was a cop on the trail back at the time, Detective Ajumara, uh, played by uh, Ken Taka, uh, Takakura um, and the detective was on the trail at the time but everything went cold and then decades later things start to warm up again and he gets called back in now this all sounds very and it's, it is a reasonable comparison uh, Les Miserables but the idea of um, Valjean and Javert isn't really what we have here because in this we have the notion that Erekai knows he deserves to be pursued, he deserves to be punished and that he's living the life of a fraud. He's living someone else's life. He feels he's, you know, gradually comes to terms with what he's done and he's stolen someone's life and he's stolen their days and now he's living large. At the same time, the police detective is not, um, he's not on it just for the sake of, of catching his man and nothing else. No, he's, he just wants to catch the criminal who committed some, some crimes. He's not, um, he's not the, um, the Javert type who would be um, like a terrier at your heels. You know, he's, he's just a good cop. Um, so we have a quite different dynamic. Um, Erikai unlike Jean Valjean, lives every day with the actions of his younger self. And he knows that justice is coming one way or the other, be it through living a miserable life or be it through the detective. Um, now this, again, all sounds like, how do you turn this into a three-hour film? Well, first of all, patience. Patience is how you do it. But second of all, through characterization. Every character that I've mentioned sounds like they could be a very stock character. The criminal who starts to regret, the prostitute, the police detective who needs to get his man. That can all be very cliche, and that's because we're so accustomed to these cliches. But in the hands of um, Ushida, we have a marvellous, marvellous portrayal of... <sighs> 
yes, crime and punishment, to use another <laughs> literary, literary illusion. Um, and speaking of literary, literary, I'll get that eventually, literary illusions, it's from um, uh, Tsutomo's mechanic. Oh, I'm sorry about the pronunciation to my friends in Japan. Tsutomo Minakami's 1700-page novel, which I haven't read, I'm sorry. Um, you can hardly get the film, never mind the novel. Um, so I can imagine that being incredibly dense at 1700 pages, just like Les Miserables is. That's an absolute massive book. Um, and it's about the idea that that does this man need punishment because he's spent decades punishing himself? It's also about can you ever truly repent for some crimes? Can you, does any good deed go unpunished? Was his act of giving the prostitute enough to wipe the ledger clean? Or was that just him trying to buy his way out of a guilty conscience? So in that regard, it's got something in common too with the likes of, stretching out a little bit, but uh, Nicholas Rogue's Eureka, where um, Gene Hackman's um, gold prospector we jump forward decades and he now has all the wealth in the world but he's miserable he's absolutely miserable because he's not who he was and who he wanted to be just like Erikai um, so Erikai may have all the success he may now be a respected person he may have changed a lot of lives for the better and he has and starting with that prostitute literally minutes after the heinous act that started this very film but but does that excuse your actions C can can a lifetime of of rights overdo one supreme wrong you know, it, it's a wonderful meditation on that but that is not to undersell the achievements of um Ishida's filmmaking he was an older man um, at the time. I think he was already in his 60s. I think he was 65, 66. Um, and had, um, I, as I mentioned, films like uh, Bloody Spirit at Mount Fiji and, and whatnot behind him, Mad Fox. Um, but he, and many more, um, but he had a very difficult past himself. And I'm not going to go into that because the extras do, and that's fascinating. Um, he, just to give you a glimpse, he had a lot of issues and guilt over what he did during World War II. Um, and that is quite pervasive in this film too, as a lot of Japanese cinema is from um, from the, the post-war era, um, where it's very much a response to um, a generation's actions in World War II um, and Japanese culture in general. Um, I don't want to, to go into that too much because again it's covered so wonderfully in the extras and it was quite revealing for me to see that um, I didn't know this part of, of his life because he didn't want people to know about it but it involves him going to some dark places literally and figuratively um, where yeah um, so it's almost not to be too wanky over it but it's almost autobiographical in that regard now obviously it was based on a book so it's not autobiographical but you can see why he'd be attracted to the material because he too was living with decades of something that he felt he had done incredibly wrong and wanted to write and was he able to put it behind him could these deeds wipe the ledger clean or at least could he end up something in the black at the end of the day yeah, um, but also the filmmaking's insane. Absolutely wonderful. Um, he uses um, 16 millimeter blown up to 35, um, but then he blows it up even further to have some some grain that shouldn't work, um, and some parts that um, with double exposures that don't that that, that are just it goes um, goes right back to the Phantom Carriage even. I mean, it's, it's um, Victor Schustrom's film. It, it, it's quite remarkable filmmaking for something that ostensibly could be just a quick little crime thriller. Could easily be that. And that's what the studio wanted. The studio wanted 
this to be on the double bill, um, and it was, that's how it rolled out with um, a high school musical. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we'll go into your presentation here. So, here's your reversible cover from Arrow. Um, and there's a, a better look at front there. Okay, okay. <laughs> Remind me to swing back to the extras. Uh, there's a um, yeah, old postcard for for promotional purposes only. Um, that's uh, blimey, blimey. And one thing, when I don't nail it, boy, do they nail booklets. Check this out. So not just as a piece of artwork. I mean, that's glorious in and of itself. Um, but um, you get A Tale of Guilt and Dread, Tomo Ishida's A Fugitive from the Past by David Baldwin. Um, Tomo Ishida's Salvation from Evil, read that. That part I'm talking about, about his own personal life, read that. Um, and about the transfer. Oh, but even now, look at the artwork. Look at this insane artwork. It's, uh, I won't go through absolutely everything here, but you know, I mean, it's full of a real synopsis um, of the film and of the film making and, you know, obviously some great stills and we're on to the second essay there just make sure now that there are a couple of um, very dark I mean obviously there's murder and whatnot, but um, there are a couple of very dark moments in it involving um, sex references that are now, in my channel you'd think why would I possibly care about that because I do some rather not so stuff but it's so gritty and realistic part of this film seems almost um, cinema verity um, Peter Watkins like that kind of thing um, so you you know it, it feels a lot more real so I would put a disclaimer if you are particularly sensitive about that kind of talk um, very Japanese show isn't it with the main characters um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, look how dense it is. Some people have complained in the past that Arrow fill up the booklets with a lot of pictures. This is two massive, massive essays here. Fantastic stuff. Um, yeah, just absolutely wonderful. And here we go. This is um, no good deed goes unpunished. Indeed. But uh, yeah. here. And there you go, the master himself. So, yeah, um, uh, presented in its original um, 240 aspect ratio with mono sound, and um, produced by and supplied by Toy from the best available archival materials. Um, and Arrow did some restoration and grading um, on that as well. Um, Fran Simeone is still um, listed um, as one of the execs on this. Um, uh, James White, top dude, um, technical producer. QC by uh, Joe Andreev and Aidan Doyle. They've done a fantastic job. Um, QC is vital in these kind of boutique releases, um, but wow, wow, they've done a fantastic job. Everything here is just, just insane. Um, Tony Stella does the cover artwork and the illustrations throughout. Um, so Tony, um, and then the design of the packaging is, is Scott uh, Sazlow. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Um, a brief word to the extras. High def transfer. I should hope so. It's a Blu-ray um, of the restored 183 minute long cut of the film. Original uncompressed mono audio. Optional English subtitles. Thank goodness my Japanese is a little bit rusty these days. Hajima Mashite. Um, introduction by writer and curator Jasper Sharp. Um, scene specific commentaries from leading Japanese film scholars Aaron uh, Gero, um, er Irene Gonzalez Lopez, Eric Homnik, Errol Jackson, Daisuke Mayo, and Alexandra Zaltan. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so although it's a bit choppy because it's scene specific, wow, the tip that you pick up on there, you go, oh yeah, 
Yeah, that, that that does remind me of of um, that part in Akira. Or oh yeah, that, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, and at the same time, it explores Japanese culture in a way that, and um, Japanese post-war anxieties and and whatnot. Um, and I hate to use guilt because it implies that they should have guilt when it wasn't them specifically. Um, but a national guilt, you know, um, in in the same way that. Um, countries should feel when they commit atrocities unlike this bloody one um, so yeah um, I've got a lot of time for the Japanese people they are to a person some of the most wonderful kind and polite people I've ever met in my life um, everyone um, um, original that's called trailer image gallery um, Tomo Ishida filmography and reversible sleeve um, so there we go ah uh, I just had to make this. Um, it's not going to be one of the videos that's going to get many clicks, many likes, many blah blah blahs. I'm kind of over that. I don't really. That's never been my bag. You know, I'd rather talk about something that I care about. And this was delivered on Saturday, and yesterday I sat and watched three hours of it in total bliss. It's a fantastic film. A complete, and I don't normally do scores on my own channel, do them on other people's at a deference to my great friends, but it is a complete 10 out of 10. And I hope now that this is wider distribution in uh, Europe and North America, that it starts to appear on more international polls, such as the upcoming, it was too late now, but the upcoming Sight and Sound poll and whatnot. Um, because to me, this is fully deserving of being up there. In, in that kind of pantheon of greats um, because it's an exploration of crime, punishment, redemption, um, self-worth, national um, shame and embarrassment um, and also it's just a terrific thriller. If you don't want to look at it thematically and you don't want to go a bit too film school on it, it doesn't matter, you'll just enjoy it as a crime movie. You'll enjoy it just as a, oh, is he going to get away with this? Is he trying to get away with it? Is the cop going to catch him? Is is the call girl going to gonna be his, his fall down? Um, you know. Yeah, wow. What a film. What a film. What a release. Arrow may have cancelled Arrow Academy, but this is the most Arrow Academy title they've released since the Decalogue. Human Condition something like that way back um, so Arrow welcome home <laughs> um, yeah folks uh, nothing more to add really check out some other videos on the channel if you want um, if you don't want to then it's fine too it's fine too uh, stay very safe out there though do my favour it is indeed a wild wild world and uh, you never know when one of those Typhoons is going to hit around here. Actually, it's quite nice out today. I might, might take the mutt out for a walk. Or, you know, just let her do the business in the bathroom and not bother. Mm. Love and mercy, my dears. Love and indeed mercy. And in this film, both of those words have quite a different meaning.